Thanks, Jeff. Wow, this is loud. I talk loud, I'm theatrical, and I stopped at the Berkeley Espresso Cafe before I came up here. So I'm like, I said to Jeff, they put something in that. And I'm super hyper right now, but thanks for um, inviting me. It's really a pleasure. Um, I had to travel pretty far. Like, you'd think it would only be an hour, but it was about 40 hours from Kruger National Park to be here. So. <laughs> Um, that's probably why I'm so hyper, because I'm pretty caffeined right now. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the Airborne Observatory at Carnegie that we've developed, and I'm going to give you uh, the history of the Airborne Observatory and what we have done with it that takes us just beyond the, the building of the technology and, and using it for kind of to advance remote sensing, but really using it in an applied way all the way to policy support. The talk is extremely picturesque. Uh, lots of photos with data, kind of punctuated with data and results. I, it's always tough to give a talk like this because I don't want to just give an overview of a program. I want to talk about the science that propels us in some depth here and there, but it won't be, it'll be kind of have its deep points and then its um, summary points as I go. Um, the whole reason we built the, the Airborne Observatory is really embedded in these three statements. One is that uh, we, we know, and we all know here, and I, I see people here who know better than me, that our biosphere is uh, changing in ways that it usually is finely grained and sprinkled very widely, but, in, but the changes are not random. And so the average conditions or changes sometimes don't really express what's going on in the system. And that might bias both our conceptual and our numerical models of how ecosystems work and how we can do prognostic studies. So really getting an understanding of the macro scale dynamics is useful, even if we can't map it everywhere, so to speak. And then the last reason is that um, I've been working heavily with Dave Schimmel and Paul Moorcroft trying to understand what is the state of the biology of the biosphere in terms of, um, of communities. And, and I like this graph on the right, uh, which Dave pulled together from various sources that really drives home that if you look at the very end of the graph, the so-called Anthropocene, suddenly we're seeing real changes in distributions of communities um, over large areas, uh, both in the measurements and in the model prog prognostic modeling work. The thing that propels me personally is um, I'm a total tropical forest junkie, if you don't know that. Uh, and I'm driven, I used to be totally driven by deforestation and logging issues, and I still am. Uh, but we've branched out to try to wonder and, and understand what's going on in the forest as it stands. This, this uh, crummy modeling uh, project that we did using the IPCC models coupled with the, uh, with the Potsdam uh, dynamic veg model does do something useful, which is it shows that prognostic, prognosis of dynamics in 2080 in intact tropical forests intact tropical forests shown in yellow, light green, and dark green don't show a uniform response to the biome to projected climate change. And whether that's real or not is not the point. It's that it's a complicated region even in the so-called dense tropical, uh, densely foliated tropical forests. So um, <clears throat> the question we try to ask with the Airborne Observatory is, how are vegetation structural, functional, diversity, and disturbance regimes changing in ecosystems? Um, we, we seem to know a lot about these issues at scales of a hectare or less usually, and occasionally, like through the Smithsonian network, up to, say, 50 hectares. We know a lot about that in, at those scales, but we know relatively little of, about that at larger scales of any kind. And I, I, you, if you know me, you also know that I'm a a user of many, many types of satellite uh, systems, and yet we do recognize that they don't give us what we need as the kind of detailed biology and ecology that is being called for these days. I'll get back to that. So what, are, what, are, what is it that we want to measure with the Airborne, Airborne Observatory? Uh, they kind of fall into three groups, and we'll start with the bottom and go up. We start with canopy chemistry, and we're interested very much so in the growth compounds, defense traits, and traits that express the longevity of plants. On the structural side, not that they're totally independent by any means, but there tends to be this effort to study structure in terms of height 
vertical profile and volume and its uh, connection to, say, biomass. And uh, altogether, we're interested in using those traits and those, those patterns of structure and chemistry, at least in my program, to try to crack open the challenge of understanding changes in plant diversity in terms of growth forms, identity at, some time, uh, at times. I'll talk about invasive species shortly. And richness and abundance. And their mediating and uh, uh, effects and controls over the, the system as a whole. These, not to bash uh, satellite work, because I absolutely am a strong proponent of it, but the truth is, is that none of our constellation really, really gets to many of these, these factors. They give us under, an understanding of forest cover, where the forest is, but not so much the details of what's going on in the forest. I also want to add to that that I'm thoroughly irritated as a U.S. citizen that we are committed to a declining constellation of satellites because we've been through a period of not launching enough new stuff. And that is a very literal, factual pro uh, projection of where we'll be at 2020 compared to today. You can see the decline of our Earth-observing system. We're just not moving satellites through the, the pipe fast enough anymore. <clears throat> so uh, the thing I've done is to build up uh, an effort to study these things from aircraft. And the latest rendition is here with uh, Dornier 228. It's the aircraft that I have. Uh, it is a, an extremely durable aircraft, unlike most aircraft. I know almost all aircraft well. Um, it's got a capability of global reach, uh, operating in extremely nasty conditions, such as in the humid tropics, and has a payload capacity that can harbor a very large system, which I'm going to talk about. The technologies on board the Airborne Observatory are mainly in two groups with a lot of details but that I won't dive too deep into. I want to get to the applications. On the canopy chemistry sh side shown in the, um, here, we use what I would call high fidelity imaging spectroscopy. And like all technologies, they come in flavors and capabilities from what I would say are low fidelity to high fidelity. S imaging spectroscopy is, instead of just treating an, uh, a spatial uh, image as one band or three bands or say six Landsat bands or whatever, we treat it as a continuous field for each pixel of the spectral response, reflectance or radiance in this case, of different materials over some wavelength range where each band is represented uh, as a different wavelength. And, those, and critically, those, those bands are contiguous with no gaps and are um, designed to, um, to have just enough overlap but not, re not total overlap in the spectrum. I'll get to that in a moment. The orthogonal or complementary technology that I know other people in this room use is called light detection and ranging, or LIDAR. And those come in different flavors and capabilities from commercial grade LIDARs to uh, overly complicated LIDARs like mine that break every day. And, uh, and there's a certain type of LIDAR called waveform LIDAR that instead of giving you a few points of three-dimensional structure, you can get a complete vertical profile of the tree canopy for each laser shot and then the ground return. LIDARs are built like spectrometers. They have different levels of sensitivity and so forth, and I'll show you a piece about that in a moment. But what this technology is getting us is more towards the structural components. Then we, at Carnegie, we've spent a lot of time with extremely high-resolution positioning systems. Uh, the, our latest systems are built using components off of a couple of noses of Tomahawk cruise missiles, and they allow us to see our ver our our movement in the air in X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, and yaw at picoradian resolutions at 400 times a second, that kind of stuff. That instead of putting a missile through a window, you want to know exactly where you are so you can project all these data back down on the ground exactly where they were when you flew over, even though the, the plane is rolling and pitching and yawing and making people throw up and stuff like that. Uh, that, that has been the technology development scheme for us since... Uh, I mean, I can pretend that I started thinking of this in 1998, but I guess I revised my history in my mind, and I, I, I kind of think I was getting towards that. Um, I'll give you some idea about the CO instrumentation. Back in this time period, back in the Dark Ages, I was totally working in Hawaii in the southwest U.S. on basically two issues of invasive species and wood encroachment, using what I would call moderate fidelity imaging spectroscopy with no LIDAR really yet. Um, the LIDAR technology wasn't there yet, and I wasn't that interested yet. 
This is the old Avarice days, if you're a NASA type, when Avarice was in its second, third, and fourth generation. In 2006 to 2011, we went through a radical trans transition and we launched the CAO Alpha system, uh, which brought us to new frontiers like Western Amazon, the border, this is South Africa and Mozambique, this is Kruger National Park, Madagascar, still operating in parts of California like Santa Cruz Island and, and always going home to Hawaii to test and, and apply ourselves. And the, the spread of topics expanded because we were starting to put together high fidelity spectroscopy, which I will, I will make that clear exactly how that's different than this, and LIDAR in integrated ways that gave us insight into invasive species, and you can read the list, habitat, we'll talk about animal movements and so forth. And then today, or as of June 2nd, 2011, we launched really what I would th argue is the most advanced remote sensing system both in the civil world and in the, in the military side as well. I'm, I'm, I'm helping them out too. And, uh, and it's called the ATOM system, the Airborne Taxonomic Mapping System. And it doesn't necessarily mean plant taxonomy. It means understanding the taxonomy of an ecosystem in general in a more generic way. It, I'm going to show you this. It uses dual lasers and super high fidelity spectroscopy with, um, with exquisite detail. And the, the list has gotten larger with our collaborators and whatnot, and what can be done with it. In pictures, briefly, this is now reeling back to the beginning of that last slide. This is, yes, these are oil stains popping out of the uh, right engine of the, the plane that I had. These are people who are um, kind of grunting it out to make this stuff happen. It, it looks like it's just quick, but I can't begin to tell you how much effort it was to even get going with the alpha system. Uh, for a while, we had the beta system. That's when JPL and Carnegie combined forces and we stole Avarice for a year to Hawaii. And we started integrating systems like the old Avarice with the Air Carnegie Airborne LiDAR and still trying to get these integrated systems to work deep in a deeply integrated way. While that happened, we started running around and adding animals uh, to my group of animals that were working for me. Uh, we went to Africa and, and we're testing these technologies in 3D and in the Amazon as well. These are just some pictures to show you that it's not just technology, but that it's a people process that, uh, that can happen without a lot of dedication and absolutely working seven days a week. Through that process, I think we're getting close to getting, to getting plant diversity metrics, and that has been this airborne taxonomic mapping system. Again, here's the plane. This is what it is. Uh, we now have two spectrometers and a very high-end LIDAR that is, uh, I would call it R&D level LIDAR. This is the group at JPL that is the sister group to Carnegie's group. And I, and I will mention that I drew, wrote the specs myself for this, for NEON, to make an exact carbon copy of these, actually two carbon copies. And NASA headquarters is making a copy. This is the visible shortwave infrared imaging spectrometer, probably the most advanced spectrometer in existence. I'm going to show that in a minute. This is another spectrometer that's called the visible near-infrared. I'll tell you about that. And this is the LIDAR. Here it is. Uh, the visible shortwave infrared imaging spectrometer measures from 380 to 2510 nanometers in 5 nanometer increments, so 480 bands. I'll show you the fidelity of that in a moment. We spent a long time building a spectrometer that has exquisitely high fidelity. Fidelity is defined in terms of the uniformity of the detector, the stability of the electronics, and the signal-to-noise performance of the actual measurement. The other spectrometer has four times the spatial resolution of this one. This is called the Wiener Zoom. It only measures from 367 nanometers to 1052, but in two nanometer bandwidth. Extremely fine spectral and spatial resolution. And then the LiDAR. Uh, this is just a uh, an instrument graph. Sorry, it looks a little rough up there on the screen, but um, in case you're an instrument person, here's the latest generation of Avarice in terms of signal to noise and on a 5% target, and the new spectrometer is double that. And with a bright target like soil, we're up in the 2,000 to almost 3,000 to 1 signal to noise range, stuff that was not at all fathomable in 2008 even. So pretty, pretty high, and that's critical for getting the chemistry. The other thing that's new is uh, the IMU technology. We use these uh, very high performance uh, navigation subsystems that tell us exactly where the aircraft is in the air at peak iridium pointing. 
And what that does, and to make a long story short, is it helps us to co-locate imagery for, f embedded in the system from the LIDAR and the two spectrometers in exactly exact boresight alignment, where we're at a 10%, 13% is a bad day for what the data alignment, 13% of a pixel. Here's what you get. Uh, this was just June of last year. The new system flew over Stanford. You can see the quad here. If you've ever been to Stanford, and there's the Palm Avenue. Uh, there's about, it depends on how you run the system, but pushing 850 uh, bands of information. And you can see the, the, one of the spectrometers <clears throat> just shown in RGB here. Uh, the LIDAR in terms of the height of the buildings and vegetation. The near infrared, the other spectrometer, you can't tell, but it's more spe spatially resolute than the other one. And, th and the waveform LIDAR gives us the vertical profile, and I just took a 10 meter slice to show you here's stuff that's 10 meters tall. Here's one for Amazonia, just still introducing the system. Uh, it's kind of the same sequence. The, the one spectrometer that does the full range, spec, uh, visible and shortwave infrared. The LIDAR in terms of height here to show you there's something about structure. The near infrared zoom spectrometer and then another slice of uh, plants that are 10 meters above the ground inside the forest canopy. One of the things that people ask me is, aren't all these measurements redundant? Why are you throwing all these instruments together? And the way, there are many ways to assess this, and we've done extremely detailed studies on this where we, we use, for example, principal components analysis. And anyone who knows about PCA, uh, the, the power of it is, is that you can understand the, the dimensionality of your data. And with the 800 bands of Adams data uh, flying over Stanford, you can get to 150 PCs, so 150 bands of unique orthogonal information. Or, or, or highly orthogonal information. You, get, you have to go way out into the four and five hundreds to get to the noise. That wasn't possible two years ago in any realm. Here's a graph of that. A, a very high-end LIDAR, this, the very high-end zoom spectrometer, a combination, a, the, just the VSWIR spectrometer, a combination of that one with the LIDAR, and then all the instruments. For those two scenes, Amazon and Stanford, you can see the degrees of freedom in the data. In the Stanford case, with the full system, there are 350 bands of unique information. So there, so there isn't a lot of correlation among, it does take 800 bands, so to speak, of data to, to create 350, but that's still extremely dimensional, lots of scientific information embedded. And you can see that it's different depending on the type of scene you have. This is a purely forested scene, so the overall dimensionality is lower than a place that has built environment and vegetation and roads and more stuff in it, or vary, varying amounts of stuff in it in terms of materials. But even in a, in a dense closed canopy, Amazon tropical forest, we're getting 200 degrees of freedom. It's not, we're no longer just looking at chlorophyll. We're no longer just looking at uh, the NDVI, that kind of thing, <clears throat> which I'll show you. You can combine this and really, this is just for fun, and you can see, oh wow, you combine these multidimensional data from LIDAR and spectroscopy, and things start to pop out. Here are the palm trees. I like those. And here's the Amazon. And I'm going to get back to this about the diversity of the colors while you see that in, in the Amazon. I'm going to take a pause and show you a, a video. The, um, the reason why we we're so focused on boresight alignment is that we want the spectrometers to exactly match the LIDAR. And it's a lot of trickery in my lab. I have a lot of engineers working on this. But this is what it produces. Where the spectral data are shown in colors here, and, and this is a retrieval of chlorophyll, chlorophyll, carotenoid, and nitrogen concentration expressed three-dimensionally in the canopy. And uh, none of this is a gimmick. These are real data. Everything is in its place, even though we're at 8,000 feet rolling, pitching, and yawing in a turbulent atmosphere. Our pico rhodian pointing put the trees back in their place and their branches, every single branch structure, uh, leaf clump. Here a, comes a big, big noniaceae swinging, flying by, etc. It's a new world we're in. <coughs> Neon is building almost this, this uh, capable, capable level of sensor. I'll show you one more because people tend to like these. Sorry it's so dark. This is only colored by height now, so it's kind of LIDAR centric. But again, you can get a sense for the, the dimensionality. Here comes a palm tree. I like looking at these with these big palm fronds. This is from 8,000 feet. Um, nobody knows we're there on the ground, which is good because some of these images are from uh, contested territory in the Western Amazon. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So, back to this. So, putting it to work. Uh, the, inside the plane, we have a laboratory with desks and computers running the systems. We have these grungy pilots that complain all day long. And we have my son who has to endure me the whole time. But <clears throat> in the end, what we <clears throat> some of the more interesting things we've done is we've looked at invasive species, tropical forest carbon stocks, habitat, and some, we're now breaking into some new frontiers of actually really asking how the system is being put together evolutionarily. I'm going to talk about that. Biological invasion in Hawaii. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, maybe a few people have noticed. Uh, Hawaii Epicenter for Invasion. Uh, I, my home is there. I'm worried about it. I grew up working with Peter Batusik, so I have all these biases. Um, here's what it looks like flying over uh, the Big Island. Big, dense, green carpet of uh, forest up in the, um, the submontane to montane region. And that's where we have focused our energy because we know where a lot of these invasive species are in the uh, human-dominated parts of the landscape. But, but the state and the federal and, and the scientists are wondering what's going on up in the uh, backcountry, so to speak. Here's an example of using extremely high fidelity spectroscopy. This is not laboratory. This is computed down with very little filtering from, uh, from airborne to, or from the air. And then trying to use the differences in these spectral signatures to fly over a place like this and quantify exactly where the invader is in its uh, cover, percentage cover per hectare in this case. That's fine. That's good. That's been happening for four or five years. But really, we want to know the impacts of those invaders up in those remote areas. Here's not so remote area, uh, just to make a point, that a lot of the invasion occurs along borders between occupied lands and protected uh, conservation lands. And here's an example of looking at the invader, invading species. And I know who these are but, uh, taxonomically. Uh, but looking at them in terms of their structure, in terms of height in this case, and then the colors here are showing what we uh, relate to the gross GPP, gross primary productivity. And you can actually see in the chemistry that these guys are growing faster than these quiet, dark, darkly colored ones. That's just coloring based on the chemical attributes. Sometimes you fly over and you see stuff like this, where you get this guy, this invasive species, in one of the most remote landscapes on the Big Island, Wakelio Puna Reserve. And then you fly over and you, you use the LIDAR and you see, well, here's that dense invader. And below that invader, it's a biological desert. It's shaded out everything. And then you find a transition where you're back to the native-dominated um, native, native system that has kind of the, bi the biological soup that you expect. Sometimes you fly over and you uh, fly over a national park where they know they have the invasive species problem. And the park management, resource management of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, would just like to put their weed cutters out on these fronts. Rather than de you know, helter-skelter, they want to do containment. This is Morella Faya. It's, uh, it used to be called Murica Faya. It's the famous Peter Batusik spe study species. Again, that's one that creates a biological desert below its canopy because it's just so densely foliated. You can reduce these LIDAR images to vertical profiles instead, waveform profiles, and see here's the forest canopy structure, vert top of the canopy down to the ground for a forest that's been invaded by this Morellifia. And here's uh, the, what it so-called should look like in terms of native species composition, where you get a multiple uh, layer forest. Totally, totally cha big change in the structure of the system. We've done this, not to go through all these, but we've done this for all types of forests in Hawaii. And I've reduced it down to these syndromes of biological invasion. One syndrome I call is death by shade. That's the one I just showed you, where you get uh, these uh, very, uh, shall we say, structurally diverse native canopies get reduced down to kind of monotypic stands that have a dense overstory with nothing going on in, in the understory. That's the one I showed you. Sometimes we get what I call death by rhizome, where the invader comes in on the understory and just really knocks out the seedling and sapling phase. And you get this loss of upper canopy over time. I call that death by rhizome. Uh, we, we have these friendly foes. We, we like to do this in Hawaii because it's just such a battleground for invasion. We give them terrible names so that we can get more funding. Um, fr friendly foes are foes that come in and do like a two-phase uh, double whammy. This is one that Flint Hughes works on where, from the Forest Service where they have this uh, albizia, Falcatera molicana, 
has come in in the overstory and lets just enough light in and drops a whole lot of nitrogen. It's an end fixer, strong end fixer. And you get another invasive species in the midstory. So you get a big change in the structure of the native versus the invaded system. And then finally, cut off at the knees is my, my favorite one because it's ruining my property in Hawaii. This uh, invasive st strawberry guava, it's Citium catalianum. It's in the Myrtaceae, which is in the same family as the native tree, Metrociterus polymorpha. But it's, got, it's from the Atlantic Forest in Brazil, and it has a real knack for putting itself in the middle of the canopy and knocking everything out above and below it, amazingly. <clears throat> what, what have been the, my, my point of my talk is what have been the management and policy impacts of this kind of work? One is that there have been a plethora of new, just from the CAO work, new initiatives, both good and bad, uh, to, to, to deal with uh, invasive species out on the frontier lands, on the back country. It's uh, quite hard to do that any other way. You're not just going to walk around out there and find these invasive species. And then uh, there is some decision to do broadcast can biocontrol against the guava tree with a, with a gall forming insect. We can talk about that later if you're interested. That was example number one. Example number two is using the Airborne Observatory to really advance our capability for carbon mapping in the tropics. I don't really have to go th through this with everybody in detail, but why does carbon matter? I get asked that by lots of policymakers, and one is, is the eco eco ecologist answer, which is the one that I really think. I think it's a great metric for integrating the effects of lots of processes, both climate, geology, and topographic processes uh, on the landscape. It's also a key variable that allows comparison of different ecosystems, but this is the one that they always talk about, red. And um, everybody know what red is here by now? Sure, most people do. It's basically the, uh, it was started in the UN, but it's actually very active in our state of California now, uh, trying to reduce uh, or provide carbon offsets for emissions by reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, the two Ds in red. Uh, we, were, we got involved in this deeply uh, because of the call for the need to monitor carbon stocks. And the thing is, is the satellites don't measure carbon. None do. They measure things that might be related to carbon. And same with airborne approaches. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, the, air, the satellite approaches so far have not proven themselves to be resolute enough in the 3D structure to really get us a grip on the biomass. So what we've done in our group is try to develop a three-part practical method that governments can start using that uses satellite data to partition the region, say, into different types of land cover, or forest cover, or land use history, all of the above and then sample it with airborne systems, LIDAR in this case, and then use that step one and two to set up a computing environment that allows them to just monitor change with the cheap satellite data again after you've got your carbon stocks mapped out. It's hard to understand unless I just show you by example. This is one I did in 2009 for the big Copenhagen meetings. Uh, I, I just picked this area in Lower Madre de Dios in, in the, the southwestern Amazon where I spend most of my time. I spend most of my time in the Colombian and Peruvian Amazons, um, <clears throat> but this is a real epicenter for a lot of reasons. I did pick it to make it about the size of Denmark because I was heading to Copenhagen to, to deal with the, the discussion that was going on there. So I tried to do something that would have some sort of geographic uh, impressiveness. But, Really, now, uh, both countries are doing this actively at the, almost at the national level. The region is beautiful. I've been in tropical forests on all continents, and this is still my favorite one. Uh, it's just crazy how, when you put a big mountain system like the Andes next to a lowland system, what you get. You get amazing diversity in soils, in topoedaphic conditions in general, and thus in the floristics themselves. And yet, the region is undergoing radical changes just since I've been working there. Uh, the deforestation rate has gone up. Logging is still a problem. Gold mining is particularly bad there. And the interoceanic highway is now done and totally active. Um, here's what the IPCC said was the carbon stocks for this little polygon of, of only 4.5 million hectares. Uh, and that was the problem, is that this isn't usable that much by, uh, by carbon compliance market type carbon trading, unless you apply such a steep discount rate that then the carbon is worth nothing. So this is what the prescribed IPCC number was, and they asked us to try to do better than that. To do that, we worked with the Peruvian government, and the first thing we did was we got together with them and understood the different types of vegetation that they had in the region. And already you can say, well, you have all these different forest types, 
These, these might be small gradations biologically, but maybe they have no effect on the carbon. We then did the deforestation mapping, which is another talk, but just to say that we made sure that we understood where the forest has, was not standing. And then we went out and through a st complicated statistical approach, we went out and sampled this region with the airborne LIDAR. And these red polygons show 20,000 hectare uh, boxes of airborne LIDAR. They're arrayed in what looks like a, uh, a biased way, but they're not. It's based on uh, stratified, um, statistically robust stratification. And again, to show you, LIDAR in these, this context is, context is extremely useful. You can see in sectional view, uh, forest clearing. And then here's some secondary forest. You see the branching from the CAO systems. Here, if you fly over, you pretty much see green carpet looking down. You can see holes in it if you're low enough. But really, the LIDAR sees that this has been heavily degraded by, in this case, uh, illegal logging. What you get out of the LIDAR is beautiful images. This makes it fun to give talks. Uh, this is just height. Red is tall and blue is short. And this is an area uh, just near Manu Reserve, Forest Reserve, or Manu National Park, I should say, where it's mostly intact. There's a little bit of deforestation. Here's the interoceanic highway. And you see the natural, uh, <laughs> the natural human act progression of the uh, deforestation as you go away from the highway but not in some sort of corridor effect. It's highly organic, just like humans behave organically. And, um, and you see degradation in terms of carbon stocks removed from reds down to yellows and greens, <clears throat> where the logging has been particularly high. I spend time there. And then you see a power line road, and you see detail. There's another one, Puerto Maldonado. You also see buildings and so forth. As you get away from the, the town, you get back up towards the higher carbon stocks. Well, you can't use LIDAR or anything by itself, so we spent a lot of time uh, putting in field plots. And in the western Amazon, we're up to around 700 permanent plots now, calibration plots with the governments, uh, that, that are used to repeat, fly over the LIDAR, fly over with the LIDAR. Um, here's a little set within this example polygon. And produce calibrations that relate the, uh, what we call airborne allometry, that's really looking at the height, but not just the height, the vertical structure is what, what LIDAR is really powerful at seeing versus the field-based uh, carbon densities from plots. And this has become very routine for us, as I will show. Putting all this together, blah, 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 and coming up with the new carbon map. And showing that the IPCC wasn't wrong, that was just not right, and, and, and that was a starting point, and that indeed the floristic composition, the actual systems themselves as they have evolved on the different soil types, which I'm skipping over now, actually impart an, an imprint of differences in carbon. High carbon in green, a little lower in yellow. Here's the deforestation. And everybody got excited about this to the point now where that's all I keep doing is flying around helping these governments do this stuff. You can get uh, nice uh, um, uh, budgets, carbon budgets out of this, where you, you can say, OK, for such and such a forest, I have such and such a median carbon value or deforested land. But really what we want are distributions of carbon. This is above ground carbon derived from airborne LIDAR uh, and the fraction, uh, sorry, and uh, the, uh, basically a frequency histogram. And what you see here is that for different forest types, you can, you don't, never, I've never seen a Gaussian normally distributed carbon uh, frequency diagram. They're all highly skewed, sometimes multimodal. Uh, if they have, depending on their disturbance regime, they're just extremely, interestingly diverse in their carbon stocks, and that what that says is, field plots alone are extremely biased. And I and I know I've had a big fight with the FAO on that for years, but they are. I mean, you can't put out field plots in, uh, across a, the Amazon basin and capture this distribution very easily, let alone different distributions among different forest types. The good thing, though, is once you spend time and money building up these baseline maps, then people are going to the simple mapping satellite maps and just cookie-cutting carbon out of this, watching for deforestation and producing emission estimates. That's what's really needed on the policy side. This is a different talk. This is class light. But, um, but what you get is a time series of carbon stocks, uh, or sorry, carbon emissions, both from deforestation and because you're doing it in a spatially resolute manner, the, de the degradation component, or, or disturbance, as we call it in my lab. Really, really, this is what RED is about. 
The great thing is that the governments, the policy impact of the CAO has been that the governments are copycatting, we're helping them build LIDARs and buy LIDARs and buy airplanes and get them situated. The Peruvian Ministry of Environment is running ahead, believe it or not, very secretly to produce really the first full national scale carbon emissions monitoring program. Colombia, our other partner, is fighting for first place. Here, here's some examples of Peruvians working with my guys. It's very enjoyable work. We have done a lot of the Colombian Amazon. This is about 40% of the Colombian Amazon basin. The, the reason I bring this up is it's interesting in two ways. I think it was interesting in that it's FARC-controlled territory, FARC. Um, and the FARC, as they have pushed, as you see in the news, as they pushed the FARC out of this region, those forested lands are becoming available to legal people and legally behaving people. And now there's a big question of what are we, what's going to happen to it. Is it going to get deforested? Big, big business, small landholder, what's going to happen? So the government is working deeply with us, and we're training them to map and monitor this, these systems. This is the, the first big one. But there's still some danger in the area, and they're shooting at anything they see fly over. So we do all the mapping at night, all of it. Uh, this is what it's like on board. Obviously, the spectrometers don't work at night, but the ladder does, and it produces 3D imagery. Same stuff. In the background, what we've been doing, I mentioned these field plots. We have this big network of LIDAR calibration plots. And one of the big breakthroughs I published this year, for us, it was like, oops, for us, it was like a big breakthrough people maybe don't appreciate yet, is uh, we figured out a universal calibration across a radical range of fluoristics, biomass levels, and degradation levels for, for sites in Hawaii, Panama, Colombia, and Peru, and Madagascar. And you can do it two ways. You can calibrate the LIDAR. This is predicted versus observed. Uh, the, the LIDAR with lots of field data with basal area and wood density included. Or if you don't know your wood density for a region, you can just use the Shav, Jerome Shav regional wood densities, and you get a pretty darn tight result that way. So you don't have to run out and get every wood density measurement in the field. And this is a, sh a, long, a short way of me telling you a long story that we have radically sp sped up the process of uh, calibrating the LIDAR to biomass. An example is in the Colombian Amazon, uh, we flew over with no LIDAR calibration plots. We mapped the biomass. The Colombian government went in, and it took them four months of negotiating with the FARC, the r remaining FARC, to go in and put in plots. And here's me, nervous that they went in there with the, with the biomass maps, and, uh, and here's them going in on, in the field. And here's the universal equation is the total prediction without any calibration, the solid line. And here is their validation line. On 10 plots, it took them four months because it's so remote. These are large plots. These are one hectare plots. So that was going, OK, it works. Um, so far, so good. I'm going to skip that and just go to this for a minute and say one of the great things about using airborne approaches is that you can derive relationships between what you can measure from the aircraft above ground carbon density and different things that you can measure from satellites still. Elevation from SRTM. This is a, a jargon term for the, how open the canopy is, whether there's bare soil showing, some terrain variables. And you can look for relationships integrated over thousands or millions of hectares of airborne measurement and find these relationships and use them to upscale. And those are three that we like. Elevation, how disturbed the canopy is, and whether there's soil showing. And from that, we're, these are just different realizations of upscaling based on different types of satellite approaches. I won't go into it. <clears throat> but all tend to converge on similar answers. So the reason I'm telling you that is you don't have to map everything in the air. That's very expensive. You can work on upscaling. One of the other things I really like is that the work is being um, accepted in Colombia, in particular, at a level where President Santos, who uh, came on board and spent the day flying with us, he also came with a Black Hawk helicopter and two fighter jets which made my entire crew nervous the whole time. We didn't want to bump into them up there. OK, so uh, next topic is, I think I got time. Yep. Next topic is looking at disturbance regimes. And for this, I'm going to take us all the way over to Africa now and a really short vignette uh, type uh, story here. We've been working in Kruger National Park. They have a big elephant problem. In, they just passed the tenfold, more, two, tenfold increase mark an elephant now versus 20 years ago. They stopped culling. There's, it's controversial. They want to know what's happening in the tree, in, the, in, the, in terms of the tree dynamics, because 
the woody canopy provides radical important habitat for a huge number of animals. This is the problem. Here's an exclosure with no elephant or fire. And they get this, the typical response, woody encroachment. I would call it woody expansion. And then here's the other problem. When you have too many elephant and maybe the wrong fire regime, you end up with not enough 3D habitat for the rest of the, the system, the species living in the system. I like that. These are not, this is not a cartoon. It's from the Airborne Observatory, flown along a, a fence line. Uh, the, all of these factors, uh, when you fly over savanna, you think flat, grass, trees. Not at all true. I learned the, the, the hard way or the fun way that the system is extremely organized by the hydrogeomorphology in terms of hill slope effects. And these are very subtle hill slopes. They do have dry or semi uh, uh, perennial uh, river systems in them. Here's a CAO image that shows the vegetation. And you can see there's something going on in these crest areas. And you look and you remove the vegetation and you can see that the termite mounds are perfectly aligned in an area that's hydrologically just above the saturated zone. So the whole system, including the termites, is very geohydromorphologically patterned. So how your elephants and fire are interacting with this, you can't just give it a one-size-fits-all. You have to really look at it in this context. So what we've been doing is flying repeat. This is just a couple of years of the data. And seeing, oh, here's a tree crown. And the next year, in 2010, there it is in red, toppled over. <clears throat> and we've been doing that in the context of these very large exclosures that the National Park System has in play, really large and um, being able to assign rates of turnover based on elephant being allowed into the system or not, fire in the system or not. The technology lets us, with LIDAR in particular, uh, locate the trees, and we've done a lot of uh, object-oriented work. We're, we're really at the forefront of this. Being able to develop <coughs> census, senses of, in this case, I was working with about 60,000 trees monitored between two years, and looking for their change. And what you notice is that the black dots are where trees fell down between 08 and 2010. It's not necessarily random. They're in clumps, just elephant life. And, um, and what we find, though, when you integrate over all of the topoidaphic conditions and everything, that you can get down to percentage rates. Some are based on being in the uplands or lowlands of this landscape. Background rates, this is with no elephant. All but elephant, that means rates with Impala, giraffe, everybody in there except the elephant, not much higher, and this is the problem they have now. They have an unsustainable loss of trees in that park. But it's also highly topoedaphically patterned. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that for time. There's also a north-south precipitation regime in the, in the national park, and where it's wetter, the pie here says that the effect of elephant is a little less so than in the drier uh, portions of the landscape, say here, with more gray means more elephant effect. And that's because resources are more scarce in the drier zone, and elephant are, are there, and they're going to use the resources um, even less sustainably. Those elephant need to learn sustainability. There's a fire feedback as well. You can't just look at elephant. You have to look at the fire. And here's a fire uh, experiment. You can see the effect on woody cover in and out of the fire zone. And here's a 10-year history of fire from MODIS. Uh, Sean Levick put this together, one of my postdocs. And you see it's not evenly distributed. There's a highly variable pattern in fire. And you might remember from the last slide, the highest fire frequencies are where it rains the most, which sounds the opposite of what you'd think, but that's where the grass biomass is the highest. And there's a, a very strong, this is from the CAO, a uh, understood effect now of fire frequency versus woody plant reduction. What we really want is a matrix of decision points for the park, national park system. You can put fire and elephant and have uh, woody canopies that have very few. <laughs> you can have no fire with elephant. You can do prescriptions now. And what they really want is something in this range right here. This is too woody at all heights above the ground. This is not woody enough. And so that's helping them to decide where to put this, put, the, put their management. It doesn't stop with elephant. Uh, Scott Laurie has just finished a postdoc in my lab. He and uh, uh, Chris, Chris Tamling from Scott Get from, uh, from not Scott Getz's lab, the other Getz, Getz here. Wayne, Wayne Getz, thank you. Um, I hope Wayne's not here, or I'm sorry, Wayne. But, uh, but working with their GPS collars and our 3D structure to understand what the view shed of hunting is like for animals. 
because this whole 3D structural heterogeneity is for the other animals, not just the elephant. Lion was a, a good one because it's interesting and get, you can get funding for it. And um, here, here's the CAO data looking at the view shed of this particular landscape, where blue means you can't see a damn thing if you're in there. Red means you can see very far. It's colored by how far you can see. And then the GPS collars and kills that, that Wayne and their lab put together came up with this, which is hard to read at first, but I'll just point to two numbers. The lure is that female lions do all the hunting and they need a wide open spaces, and that their kill radius is about nine meters from the time that they are hunched down to when they attack. Believe it or not, it's from airborne data, combined with GPS. Well, what wasn't known, or at least wasn't agreed upon, was that in the very dense woody vegetation, the male lions are hunting a lot. Here are the different species they hunt. But they only need about a few meters of, of, of distance, and they, they're more stealthy, and they take out these, uh, their prey in dense vegetation. That means that when you are using elephant management and fire management, you have to think about both the open systems and the closed systems in terms of predator-prey interactions. That's totally new. It's not even uh, accepted yet. Skip that. Um, finally, to finish up, I just want to talk a little bit more about the futures now and where we're going today with the CAO. It's really in the realm of functional and biological diversity in tropical forests. I focus on canopy chem. It's what my training originally was in as a budget chemist is really canopy chemistry. And I like to say that it mediates everything and that it tells us about evolution and that it's untapped. That's how you get funding, right? So uh, what we've done is develop radical methods of using super high fidelity or high fidelity imaging spectroscopy to build a database that lets us go from these integrated uh, 3D chemical, 3D spectral measurements through uh, lookup tables to chemistries and the holy grail is to try to get from the chemistry eventually to some sort of biological diversity understanding. And to do that, we had to develop a program to run around in the field for three years and we still keep going. We call it spectronomics, which expresses the linkage between both the uh, phylogeny side of this, the spectral side, and the chemical side of this. It has three components, this field program, the instrumentation that I've already talked about and actually using it. We've been everywhere, and I've been in every one of these sites on every single uh, climbing expedition. We have about 10,500 canopies now with 7,000 tree species, tree and liana and hemiepiphyte species in these sites. And what we figured out from this, oh, sorry, some fun pictures to see places we've been. My crew, who I um, have the very best climbing taxonomists, parataxonomists you're going to find. Uh, by the way, this guy, Jeff, worked, climbed for Al Gentry for 18 years. He's my chief climber, still going strong at 58 years old. Uh, we have an incredibly spirited group. I have a lab in Lima, but we operate globally from Lima. Uh, and also collaborators all coming together to climb trees, get samples, uh, stabilize them under excru excru evil, I, they call it the evil um, protocols that I've developed because the spectroscopy is totally unforgiving if there's any slop in this process. And developing over at Stanford our, our what we call the frozen forest, our cryogenic facility for holding these samples. You can go on and actually see where the samples have been collected and get information and we're starting to populate the chemistry as the postdocs and grad students do their papers and whatnot, letting them have their shot at publishing and then the data go up. What we've learned just by basic chemistry in one minute or less is that, uh, of course, soil fertility imparts a huge effect on a range of chemical traits in canopies. This I published with Robin Martin in New Phytologist last year as one example, but we see it globally. Um, we see, for example, that in humid tropical forests, nitrogen rarely matters as you go from high fertility. We already know that from Batusik and Sanford and many studies of the past. It's just not a good metric for looking at functional differences across sites. What's really where the action is is in rock-derived nutrients like base cations and phosphorus, and also in the defense compounds. Low fertility system tend to harbor species with much more investment in lignin, phenols, and tannins. It's the Paul Fine kind of stuff. I'm like a student of this, as I've learned it from the remote sensing side. Or you can look at it uh, in terms of growth form. Uh, we also talked about this. I'm trying to get a paper out that's global now that shows this pattern holds up across 
all sites globally, but with an interesting twist based on climate, that lianas invest systematically in, uh, in say, uh, light capture and growth compounds differently than trees. They're much more, uh, much less. The liana is much less in the defense compounds and much more in the rock-derived nutrient or, say, metabol metabolism-type elements and compounds. While that's been going on, and we're understanding the chemistry, we're doing the spectroscopy with those. And the new high-fidelity spectroscopy is letting us dive into things that in the 80s and 90s uh, were hard to get at and are getting easier to get at, like, say, the partitioning of different photosynthetic pigments, as an example. And what I think we've figured out, or what we're comfortable with in our lab, is that these are still wishful thinking elements and, and compounds to remotely sense, but that this upper group, and this is a complicated matrix, but I just put a circle, we're, we're doing well with a lot of these often. Hemicellulose maybe shouldn't be in the box, but from phenols up, it's, it's gotten a lot easier to, to get estimates of these from the air. Here's an example, uh, proving Amazon. This is a crummy DEM that I threw in this morning. I, I forgot to put one in, but this, this, the forest is here, and then it drops down by just 10 meters. This is what we call terra firma, and this is inactive floodplain. And here's a chemical uh, retrieval from, the, from atoms, and you see color here that ends when you get down to the lowlands, and there's a new set of colors. And what we've done is we've been able to, and here are the trees when you zoom in, we've been able to peg this to floodplain forests have systematically higher rock-derived nutrients, lower investment in defense, and nothing going on with nitrogen or LMA, leaf mass per area, nothing. Uh, terra firma forests have much lower investment, or I should say lower concentrations. I think the investment is high, but the concentrations are low in these very uh, uh, sparse or scarce rock-derived nutrients up on the terra firma portion of the landscape, and lots of investment in defense and longevity compounds. And then there's always a funny one in the middle, right in the middle of your project, these palm uh, swamp forests that do their own thing. Some, almost a monotypic stand of Mauritia flexuosa. But my point being is that they show themselves nicely in the chemical retrievals from the Airborne Observatory. You can really get crazy with this, and I'm, I think I'm getting totally over my head in this, studying this, is trying to understand if there's any phylogenetic or basic taxonomic um, expression among these chemicals, and there, there is. This isn't new to people like um, David Ackerley or, or Lissy Coley, but it's interesting to see that the, the photosynthetic pigments have a little bit of a taxonomic partitioning, whereas like the defense compounds have a strong taxonomic partitioning. You can get crazy with this and really look at it, but what's fun is that you fly over an area that looks like that, and really in the chemistry it looks like that, and you reflect on what I just said, that different chemicals have different amounts of phylogenetic signal or taxonomic partitioning, and you start to wonder how the system is being put together. And I do not have an answer. This is my futures wrap-up few slides. And you see there's some very big differences in species. This is that uh, Mauritia flexuosa. You see it all one color. Sorry, this is colored by nitrogen phenols and something related to leaf thickness. And then you see some similarity between species if they have the same color, but you see lots of diversity as well. This is to convince you that it's actually really working. This is a eucalyptus plantation that has all the same traits because it's one species. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite ones. I'm trying to figure out. It's in the 50-hectare plot at BCI with Joe Wright. We're trying to figure this out. This is what it looks like when you fly over, and this is what we see. Why on earth do we see clumping of the chemical traits on the landscape? Is it just soils? Some people say yes. Others say no. We're trying to dissect this, and my point is, is that now we have a means to start looking at the landscape um, in a diagnostic way. And you can do it in 3D as well. I want to uh, close by saying that if you're interested in this, we are always expanding our collaborations, and uh, definitely go to our CAO website, cao.stanford.edu. You can check out the videos, and you can get papers, and you can see what's going on, and I use this to also thank the people who have taken the risk with me on this, which is all private money, because no federal government would be in the right mind risk, risk what we've done here. So um, it's really Mellon, MacArthur, and the Moore Foundations with help from the Grantham Foundation as well. Thanks a lot.
<clears throat> uh, thanks. Uh, that was, um, I love all the great Where, examples. Wave at me. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi. I'm, I'm Alan. Um, hi. And uh, I, I love all the great examples you gave, and I'm uh, pretty impressed by the high fidelity spectroscopy. Um, I've have a, I've had a history of interest in that in relation to detecting different types of stress. And yeah. so the, the detail that you're getting to identify different species and biological diversity, or potentially identify that, I'm curious if um, you've looked at or, or thought about uh, the, the subtleties that you could detect with this system in relation to, to different types of stress, air pollution, uh, ground pollution, that sort of thing. My, I have my generic answer that I tell myself and people that ask me like you that if that stress is expressed in the chemicals that we can detect, then you'll probably get it. But always it, then my question is, what's the, uh, compare, what's the baseline that you're comparing to, right? So, um, for example, in the Western Amazon, one of the major things I'm trying to figure out is what the 2010 drought did to the canopy. So I was lucky, to, lucky enough to be flying in the region in 2009, then we had the mega drought. And you maybe read that the Western Amazon dried up, the, the river at Manaus was dry, blah, blah, blah. It was dry in Peru, too. I was there, extremely dry. And the canopy definitely went through some radical change. And we flew it again last year to, to assess before and after. And we see chemical differences in the maps. What, what, what I don't know is um, how to associate that with stress or maybe recovery, right? Maybe the stress occurred and I'm seeing a net change. So to me, the, it's hard to do chemical mapping, but it's really hard to interpret it in terms of stress or recovery or from stress. So it, I know it's a crummy answer, but that's ex actually the same grappling I'm doing as you, basically. <clears throat> Bill. I, I call people like you, and I say, here are some relationships. Yeah. I hadn't thought about the scaling with just your observations first and the broader work. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think that we're all talking about it, and there isn't enough work in it, and I would definitely say there's opportunity. Um, Paul Moorcroft just spent a big chunk of his sabbatical with me, and we had this big plan. I like answering questions with stories, I know. We had this big plan that... I was going to show him all this stuff, and somehow Ed 3 would, and I don't know this, you know. Well, he left, and we actually kind of didn't do anything because we couldn't figure it out. It's so compli complicated. It seems to me that what we need to do, if I can do it in a super lay person kind of uh, wording, is that if I can produce relationships that are landscape style functional relationships, that then the modelers need to use those, right? And that maybe we don't have all the spatial heterogeneity in the models, but somehow that embedded in the models are those spatially, spatially uh, determined or driven or somehow mediated relationships from the airborne data. And that that's where I can best provide input. You know what I mean? I, I don't think so. I think Paul is one of the colleagues that we all have that we know that is kind of trying to figure that out. But... I think Neon will also have that problem. I, I help Neon out quite a bit. Neon, does everyone know what Neon is? National Ecological Observatory Network. Um, when, when I did the specifications to, for them to copy the CAO, uh, they didn't even have in mind quite yet what they would do with the data. And now Dave Schimmel, who's you know, very forward thinking, is coming up with what I just said, basically. He, he probably could sit, stand up here and tell you exactly some functional form of two a chem, you know, a growth chemical and a defense chemical, and how that could transform the GCMs or something. But I'm I'm just so far from that that I don't have a way to to explain it well. David. Okay. So you're asking me, uh, have I done the study yet that says? How diverse is the spectroscopy of a, of, a, of a landscape as you go from, say, a, from between soil types and whatnot? Or mapping to species that are responsible. Mm. So, you know, you don't need the identity, you just get signatures of diverse problems. There's, I, yes. We can certainly make now, we're, we're actively making maps of, like, uh, 
in the Amazon, we say, the, where's the hottest of the hot spot, right? Because the whole thing is diverse, right? So it's kind of at that, on the skewed end of the whole diversity, alpha diversity kind of thinking. Um, what I, what's hard, what I think the frontier of that is, I can make you a map that says, okay, here's spectral diversity, and it definitely maps to a high points in biological diversity, canopy biological diversity versus, you know, some low spots and stuff like that. And, and those low spots occur in swampy areas that are anoxic and are just not supporting as much diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Or we go up the Andes and we see the spectral diversity decrease. As we cross 1,500 meters, it just goes down. And by the time we hit tree line, we have 30, 40 canopy species versus per hectare or per observation area versus hundreds down the lowland. And that spectral diversity does decrease. What's hard is that um, I think that the frontier is trying to figure out the, the relative importance of richness and abundance in that process. And I think there's a ton of work to do there. That's, nobody is, we're still, nobody is really doing it. So, uh, and, 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 and the role, I should say, I didn't quite finish the sentence, and the role of intraspecific variation in that. Yeah. 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 Okay. How many uh, calibration points do we have? Yeah, say. Well, From the, in the field or from the airborne? From the airborne. Uh, up to thousands, if it's a big, uh, so a real big fabaci, you, you know. Like how much variation in some of those chemicals you know, you get per canopy? Mm -hmm. And then how much variation within species you get per individual species? Uh-huh. Yeah, that, that, that really for sure. One of the great things I like uh, about these images uh, out of the gate is that here's a, here's a tree crown that uh, is colored specifically by three chemicals, and if those chemi if it had high intra crown variation, you wouldn't see a nice object here, right? So you start to be able to pull this apart. Where we have, I know this one and this one, <laughs> Joe and I are right and I are figuring this stuff out. This is one that has three liana in it. Liana is draping into the canopy, and so we're trying to figure out. I guess I don't have an answer, but we're trying to figure out uh, how much of that is intra specific and inter specific variation. One, the one thing I like about defense compound mapping is that the intraspecific variation is pretty low in sunlit canopies. You get edge effects from shading and the phenols are coming and going and stuff like that in concentration, but by and large those are, they're like committed to, you know, whereas I wouldn't do it with chlorophyll. You get lots of intra and in, intraspecific and intra-crown variation. So I, I don't like doing mapping of any kind of functional diversity towards biodiversity using chlorophyll. It's just uh, way too variable within a crown. Um, what else? But then, I mean, you can, if you overlay the 50 hectare class, you would know which of those circles corresponded to which tree. So then yeah. what's the variation in, say, fence chemistry between the species that have been identified? Okay, what is the variation in chemistry? So maybe I'll answer it this way. The intra, in this system, the intraspecific variation in f total phenol concentration mm -hmm among different individuals was, I guess, the, the median value, the global type value is about 35 to 40% variation. And intraspecifically, it's running about 7% in the upper canopy. So not perfection, but a lot of uh, mappability out of that. In chlorophyll, we get 30% variation within a crown, and about that maybe a little more 40-ish among the crowns, so to speak, whether it's intraspecific or even among crowns of the same species. So it's very chemically, um, that's why this graph really helps us. That's all embedded in something that I totally didn't talk about is this remote sensing use index. Should we use it or not? And um, water is extremely stable for some reason. Nobody seems to understand that, why that's so good. Um, the water content of canopies, if you take all the, you know, uh, species on the landscape at time X, unless it's in a, a period of leaf fall, they tend to, those intraspecific variation in upper canopy water is pretty, pretty stable at the time of overflight. So 
among species, and so forth and so on, down to manganese, which is all over the place, and not remotely sensible, so to speak. Great questions for, and definitely deserving of more, a lot of work. So yeah, I mean, the reason I'm never in California is that's what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, so in, in Peru I do that, and then the, our collaborators and two of my postdocs in Panama are doing that. Hawaii, Jim Kellner and people did that, he was a postdoc of mine, uh, across Peter Vitusik's substrate age gradient. And uh, by and large, I see a lot of environmental filtering, as some people call in terms of the canopy chemistry expression. Things definitely tend to... Uh, and, and that a lot of, at least in the Western Amazon, a lot of the time, a lot of the time that also coincides spatially with changes in floristic composition, not just chemistry. So, yes, yeses to pieces in parts of that question. Yeah. But yeah, this is the value of this, is we can start doing this finally. Uh, sorry. Okay, go for it. Yeah, these guys, these guys never get enough. <laughs> I haven't seen you for 12 years and you give me the impossible question. Now I, frontier, get us, get, us, uh, get us a hell of a lot of money and we'll keep flying over your canopy. <laughs> uh, Jeff, and then we'll work our way back up. I, I don't know because Brazil doesn't let me fly over Brazil. You know, I've never been let back in since 2005. So, so um, but in the Western Amazon, we can still go from oxisols, tertiary and Cretaceous substrates to late Holocene substrates. And you go radical changes in edaphic conditions uh, and you get chemical differences between those and, and one can project that those would have differences in GPP, say. No, I'm a, I'm a Western Amazon junkie, so, yeah. I would, yeah, I would. In, in Madagascar was a bizarre place because they have these cobalt and all sorts of weird metals in the soil and you see all sorts of crazy stuff in the chemistry and the spectroscopy. We saw new spectra that like nobody, I thought the system was broken. But the plants there, yeah, there's some really interesting stuff that's still undiscovered out there. And that's what I was trying to build is a system to discover these things for the first time. So maybe we will as a community, not me. <laughs> so, uh, Dennis. <laughs> to make us not fly. So. <laughs> uh, we fly the LIDAR under clouds often. Uh, um, 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 often we fly under clouds for the LIDAR. For the spectrometers, they, that is a huge constraint over us and we spend long periods of time in a region for that one special day of flying. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, the promise is that you should write to your senator. And, um, there are a couple of proposals. So, so there is a NASA mission called Hispiri, which is a spectrometer and thermal IR mission. Uh, I'm deeply embedded in that issue of Hispiri, and it, the, the, real wor the real thing is that there's no way it's launching between 20, before 2022, not a chance. And it's probably later than that, if ever. But there are some other proposals that I'm part of that are going through through the Venture, Earth Ventures program, which can really uh, speed that up potentially. One is called GTEO, Global Terrestrial Ecosystem Observatory, GTEO. If it's selected and makes it down the pipe, then we could see a launch of the VSWER style technology, the high fidelity spectrometer. We would see that launch 2012, 16, 2016. The LIDAR technology, maybe you saw 
uh, sadly enough, the Desini mission was near, you know, if it's not totally trash now, it's like, you know, it was canceled and maybe they say it's not, it's like uncanceled slightly, but it's not happening, happening. But the, the EU, ESA, the Euro, Europeans are moving forward with the biomass mission for the spaceborne LIDAR. So I'm, I'm hopeful, um, but I agree. If we could get especially the spectrometer into, into space, I think we would make really fundamental new discoveries. The LIDAR we need, what we'll do there is do better carbon mapping and fluxes, right? But the spectrometer is going to open up, I think, a whole new, totally new frontier. That's why I'm, I'm hoping that they do push that. Uh, can I go up and then down? Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I have this weird feedback loop with the DOD on this, and um, they're trying to figure out ways to reduce the size of our, our design into something that would be UAVable, as they say. And um, it's tough. It's, uh, it's, you need a large control system on these spectrometers. This spectrometer is, uh, requires the detector to be at 144 Kelvin. It's quite hard to manage that. It requires a lot of subsystems. The detector just doesn't count the photons unless it's so still. Um, it also requires it to be under vacuum at minus 7 tor, uh, even minus 7. And that also has a big subsystem. So it's that kind of stuff that's holding it up. I don't have the answer. They, they have lots of money, and maybe they'll figure it out. But I just know that those are their, their challenges. Just like Bill, no, I don't want any more. I th I'm thinking about a thermal spectrometer because of the animals in Kruger. Imagine flying at 5 a.m. when the ground is cold, getting those animals in that 3D habitat. That'd be fun. I haven't yet. Yeah. yeah. In, at the time, yeah, that, I think the answer to that question is how representative is your time of observation, your flight to the system, but, yeah, okay. I don't know. You mean like the croc? The croc uh, mortality? Zebra. Sable antelope, maybe. I, my short answer is I have no idea. Uh, to me, what... What we see in the spectroscopy flying over in the high, new high fidelity spectroscopy are chemical concentrations. And then the, the causes of those patterns, yeah, I mean, that's something that specialists like you would want to look at and put it in context, landscape context. But yeah, oh yeah, we have a, we have a huge, for three million samples in that thing. Yeah, so, what we're, so that's a good question. So the spectronomics project, this thing, uh, we're, what we're doing, it's, we need another year, maybe, maybe less. We're just in this now, is uh, trying to make this thing so that you can go in, you can look geographically or taxonomically, or you can say, I want any species that has a, an LMA range of X to Y. You can do it chemically. Find what you want, and then we're going to have a form on the website where you say, this is me, this is what I want to do, and here's why. And then we're just going to make sure that no, you know, pharmaceutical companies, because we're not allowed to do that kind of stuff, uh, 
research can come in. Yeah. Carnegie can't mix with the, with the commercial world. I know, but we, that's not the kind of money we get. But, um, but, but if you're a researcher, academic style researcher, you want to come in and get sample, then you'll be able to come to the lab at Stanford and check out the sample, get it, get, you know, see how much we have and how much you need, and, and actually take it away and do what you want with it. No, everything is in, in minus 80 cryogenic. Yeah. Yep. That's a good question. I forgot to advertise that. that. That's part of what I'm trying to do is make these tropical forest species accessible to the community. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't say that. So. Bill, you set him up for that. So we're okay. So so far we got a radar. We got what was your thing? Every week. Oh right, every every week, and now a gas sampler. It sounds like a Berkeley Stanford consortium type of thing. We're going to need a, a fleet. We need a, a squadron apparently. Okay.